Good evening and welcome to Revelations of Prophecy. I won't be able to say that too many more nights. This is Tuesday. We have Wednesday and Friday and then the Sabbath and then we're finished. But have I taught you everything there is to know from the Bible? Oh no, there's so much more. So we trust you'll continue studying. We were talking about how that you have the spiritual food. I hope that you, as you've come here night by night, you've been fed spiritually. When the seminar is over, you know what you have to do? You have to feed yourself. <laughs> so I want to encourage you, study God's Word. You will be blessed. A couple announcements tonight. Those of you that are with Jory, Benoya, welcome. I understand you're watching at home, the internet live, so welcome to you, your group. A welcome to those of you up in Manila that are watching, and those in Iloilo, and I think there's about nine other sites here in the area that are watching this. Mountain View College, welcome. We're actually planning to visit Mountain View this week. Also, another announcement, someone left a pair of glasses here. I lost my glasses. I haven't checked to see if these, these will work, but anyway, somebody gave me some glasses, so now I have a pair. I lost a pair, but it was in a taxi, so I'll never see them again. But somebody lost a pair here. If you are missing your glasses, well, you need to be able to see. If you're watching uh, this program, you used to come, well, come get your glasses. Come back and get your glasses this week. This, well, I don't know if the case will help, but these are uh, black glasses. I don't know if they're reading glasses or seeing glasses, whatever kind of glasses. If they're yours, then come and claim them, either up after the meeting or we'll leave them at the registration table. Tonight, oh, before, we, before I share with you the lesson you'll get tonight, a thank you for those of you who have given offerings for our seminar expenses. We appreciate that. Let's start with our quiz from our last lecture. And that was the unpardonable sin. So take, up your, take out your quiz card, your quiz envelope. Those of you watching on the internet or in some other site, take out a piece of paper. You can do the quiz also. Question number one is a review. There are four primary functions of the Holy Spirit in working upon our hearts. Four things that the Holy Spirit does for us. Name two of them. There are four th primary functions of the Holy Spirit in working upon our hearts. Four things the Holy Spirit does for all of us. Name two of them. He... Mm, us and mm? well you can use your notes by the way if you took notes this is an open note quiz those of you that take notes you're glad you did the rest of you well learn from your mistake <laughs> take notes tonight number two true or false one of the things we can do against the Holy Spirit is to resist his leading in our lives one of the things we can do against the Holy Spirit is to resist His leading in our lives, right? True or false for that question. Number three is also true or false. The Holy Spirit cannot remain in the life of someone who is willfully continuing to disobey the will of God. The Holy Spirit cannot remain in the life of someone who is willfully continuing to disobey the will of God. True or false. Number four is also true or false. If we neglect to make a decision to obey Jesus or Bible truth, we have begun the process of committing the sin which God can never forgive. If we neglect to make a decision to obey Jesus or Bible truth, we have begun the process of committing the sin which God can never forgive. True or false. Number five, last one, also true or false. The unpardonable sin is any sin that we continue to practice till we no longer hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Number five, true or false. The unpardonable sin is any sin that we continue to practice till we can no longer hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. 
Let's review, see how well we did. You can grade yourself. Number one, there are four primary functions of the Holy Spirit in working upon our hearts. Four things that the Holy Spirit does for us. Name two of them. Teach, guide, convict, unite. Oh, you got them all. And if you got them all, you can give yourself extra credit tonight. If you're able to put down more than two. Number two, true or false, one of the things we can do against the Holy Spirit is to resist His leading in our lives. What's the answer? That is actually true. We can resist. That's one of the things we do against the Holy Spirit. We can resist His leading in our lives. Number three, the Holy Spirit cannot remain in the life of someone who is willfully continuing to disobey the will of God. That is true. Number four, if we neglect to make a decision to obey Jesus or Bible truth, we have begun the process of committing the sin which God can never forgive. That's true also. Number five, the unpardonable sin is any sin that we continue to practice till we no longer hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. That is true. Except for number one, the rest of them were all true. How many got 100% on the quiz? All right, looks like some of you did. <laughs> Maybe number one was the, you forgot to take notes on it. We're going to sing this song as they pass the baskets. You can drop in your quiz card with your questions. Tomorrow night is question night. There'll be no health lecture tomorrow night. We'll be answering questions. So, and I have a number of questions that have come in. If you want to write in some more questions, we'll take time for questions tomorrow night. As they pass the baskets, let's sing this song together. Breathe on me, breath of God. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. That I may love what thou dost love. sang that song first time tonight? Oh, quite a few of you. Well, we learned a new song. I don't know if you noticed that song was actually a hymn. And many of the grand old hymns are actually prayers. What did I say? That song was a hymn? Yeah. That hymn was a prayer. <laughs> many of the psalms are actually prayers. And some of the hymns are prayers. I like that hymn. This is your lesson tonight, number 25. In God we trust, question mark, or is it in the peso we trust? Anyway, you'll get this lesson. This is the last lesson we'll be giving you. I hope you have all the lessons by now. These are the extra ones. Some of you got these already. If you didn't get one of these, and you want to do all the lessons and get your diploma this coming Sabbath evening, then be sure and ask at the table on your way out. We'd like to have all the lessons completed by tomorrow evening so that we can grade them and return them to you on Friday. 
So if you're doing the lessons, you want to get them all done, get your diploma, then please have them in to us by tomorrow night. This is your diploma. We'll be giving that to those who complete, have completed all the lessons as of this Sabbath. So if you're doing them, please turn in your final ones tomorrow night. We'll grade them, return them to you on Friday. We still have a few days left for visitation. So if you're thinking about baptism, or if you'd just like to talk about questions you have, then sign up for a visit. Put down your name at a time slot that's convenient for you. We have tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday. If you just have questions, then put a question mark by your name. If you want to be baptized, put a cross by your name. If you are not sure, well, you can put a question and a cross. That's okay. And we'll plan those visits either over at the Camus Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is very close to here. That's where most of our visits have been. Or over on uh, Palm Drive. So look at the sheets. We have a sheet for Camas Street. Look at the top of the sheet. There's also a sheet for Palm Drive. If that's more convenient for you, sign up on that sheet. We'll meet you there. If those locations don't work for you, then be sure and talk to us. We'd be happy to make some other arrangement. We'd like to visit with you. Our baptism is this Sabbath, 2 o'clock. And I should have been able to... Where, what's the location? Pastor Patalinga, can we tell the... What is the location? Vista Grande. Okay, I hope you know where that is. We'll announce that again on tomorrow and Friday. And maybe we can give you a map or put up a map so that you can find the place. We want to invite you to be there. If you're not being baptized, please come and celebrate with us. Those of you being baptized, that's where we'll be on Sabbath afternoon. Tomorrow night, Modern Magic, Miracles, and the Occult. Probably the most shocking topic in our seminar. That's why I put it off so far, almost down to the end. But we hope you'll come for this. We're going to show how you can know from the Bible whether a miracle is from God or the devil. You need to know that. So be with us tomorrow night. Thursday is no lecture here in this venue. Maybe in the site where you're watching. Friday night, our topic will be the last night on earth. That'll be a great study. Then on Sabbath, Saturday, our topic is God's washing machine. God does have a washing machine. We'll find out what that is on Saturday. Now, did you note the time we have listed? 8.30. You say, wow, that's early. Well, some of you are probably thinking that's early. Normally, we have Sabbath school before the worship hour. Seventh-day Adventist churches, we have Sabbath school. And here in the Philippines, Sabbath school generally begins in the Seventh-day Adventist church at 8.30. So we're going to invite you to join us at 8.30 Saturday morning right here. We're going to have Sabbath school. And by the way, Sabbath school, for those of you that are not familiar with Sabbath school, that's not just for children. Sabbath school is where we study the Bible together. It's more of a class type format. It's for adults. Now, most churches have a program for the children also. And we're going to have a program for the children also on Saturday. My daughter's here doing the pr program for the children. But 8.30 will be Sabbath school, and Pastor Patalinga, he is our mission president here for the Devout Mission. He has kindly consented to teach our Sabbath school, so he'll be our teacher. That'll be from 8.30 to about 10.30. Uh, we have a couple hours for Sabbath school. And then at about 11 or so, we'll have the topic, God's washing machine. I don't know if it's going to be quite that. But anyway, we'll divide the time in about half. Sabbath school the worship hour. So we invite you to be with us Sabbath for the morning, and then in the afternoon we're going to have our baptism, and then in the evening we'll have our final seminar lecture. We'll have our graduation for those of you that have finished all the lessons. Baptism, there it is. That'll be in the afternoon. Let's stand now and sing our theme song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from you. We're thankful for the gift of life, the gift of time, the gift of health, the gift of treasure. We pray tonight as we consider the Bible secret to financial prosperity, that you would teach us the truth from your word. Bless each watcher and each one who's here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. Our topic for tonight, the secret to security and financial prosperity. Let me ask you, have you ever wished you had more money? How many of you? Ever, ever wish that? Uh, if you didn't say yes in your mind, you're probably not being completely honest. Did you ever feel like you had too many bills? Did you ever have, feel like you have not enough income but too much outgo? Did you ever feel like the, your money just wasn't worth what it used to be? It takes more and more money to buy less and less stuff. Did you ever feel like the bills or maybe your debt is sort of like this huge monster? And when your paycheck comes in, the monster rises up and oh, before you know it, it's all gone. Where it went, I don't know, and I still have more bills to pay. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like your pockets were empty? You ever feel like your money is going down the drain? There's an interesting verse from the book of Haggai. Take your Bible and turn to Haggai chapter 1. I don't know if you can find Haggai, but it's there in the Bible. The page is on the screen if you need the help to find this little book. Haggai 1 verse 6. I think this is the first time so far in our seminar we've gone to this little book. Haggai. Haggai is so short, it only has two chapters, but it's got some important information here about finances. We're reading from Haggai 1 verse 6. God says, you have sown much and bring in what? Little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with what? With holes. Did you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like your money's going into a pocket? It's got all, I don't know where the money's going, but it's disappearing. I put it in the pocket. I put it in my wallet. I, it disappears. Do you ever feel that way? Well, we want to find out tonight how to plug those holes. Tonight we're going to look at the Bible secret to security and financial prosperity. And this is a secret that some of the world's wealthiest individuals have utilized. You say, Pastor, I'm getting excited. What's the secret? We're going to find the secret in a story that took place in the life of Jacob. Jacob, you may remember, was the grandson of Abraham. Abraham was a very wealthy individual passed on much of his wealth to his son Isaac. Isaac was a multi-billionaire by our standards today, and that's not in pesos either. That would be in euros or dollars. And you may remember that Jacob was the twin brother of Esau. Esau was born first, and back in those days, the firstborn got the largest portion of his father's inheritance, along with being the spiritual leader of the home. Jacob wanted to be the spiritual leader, and so he succeeded in cheating his older twin out of the birthright blessing. And Esau got so angry with Jacob, he threatened to kill him. And so Jacob fled from home. And he fled back in the days when, you know, they didn't have ATM machines and credit cards and traveler's checks. Back then, they had silver and gold. Is that easy to carry? No, those are heavy metals. So Jacob probably fled home virtually penniless. He wanted to flee as quickly as he could, so he traveled light. And by the way, he didn't flee in a jeepney or a Toyota. They didn't have those things. He didn't even flee on a horse. You know why? And of course, they had a lot of horses, I'm sure, and camels. His brother was a mighty hunter. And so he wanted to leave as little trace as he could as he fled from home. Fled from home, basically penny, penniless. And it was on that flight... You may remember the story of the dream he had. Take your Bible and turn back to Genesis. Let's read about it here. Genesis 28, and we're going to read verses 11 to 15. We won't read all of that, but you can mark it in your notes. Genesis 28, 
We'll start reading with verse 11, the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Genesis 28, verse 11, that says he, that's Jacob, lighted upon a certain place. He arrived at a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. Of course, he didn't have, didn't, they didn't have flashlights back then. So when the sun sets, you had to stop traveling. So he stopped for the night. He took of the stones of that, see, he was so poor, he didn't even have a pillow with him. He took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. He had left a, probably a multi-billion dollar family and he'd fled like one of these beggars, you know, you meet out on the street, had almost nothing, didn't even have a pillow, used a rock for a pillow. And verse 12 says, he dreamed and behold, a ladder set upon the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. You probably have heard or may have heard of the story of Jacob's ladder. Here it is in Genesis 28. The ladder reached all the way from Jacob was, where he was, all the way up to, to God. The ladder, by the way, represents, anybody know? Represents Jesus. If you're taking notes, John 1 verse 51, the ladder is Christ. The connecting link between earth and heaven. The ladder reached from God all the way down to Jacob. And Jacob was pretty low down at that point. Felt pretty discouraged. And I don't know where you are in your experience. If you feel discouraged, sort of down and out, nobody cares about me, remember this. The ladder, Jesus, reaches all the way down to you. And you can get on that ladder and you can start the ascent to God. Well, Jacob, he was so touched by God's mercy. In fact, notice the promise that God made to Jacob, verse 15. Genesis 28, verse 15. God said, Behold, I am with you and will keep you in all places where you go and will bring you in again into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you of. Jacob was so moved by God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God's love, he made a vow. And in this vow, we find the secret, the Bible's secret to financial prosperity. Let's read the vow, verses 20 through 22, Genesis 28. Genesis 28, 20 through 22, it says, Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat... Raiment to put on, going to take care of my needs, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give thee me, I will surely give the what? Give the tenth unto thee. There's the formula. The Bible formula for financial prosperity. When Jacob made this vow, he had almost nothing. He was like the beggar you meet on the street corner. But by returning a tenth back to God, Jacob in just a very brief time, just in a few years, he went on to become one of the wealthiest individuals in the entire region. God blessed him abundantly in flocks and herds and wealth. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 10 verse 22, read with me. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Would you like to have the blessing of the Lord? That's the only way to have riches. How did Jacob get the blessing of the Lord? He made a vow, I'm going to return one-tenth to you. Of all that you give me, I'm going to give a tenth back to you. That was Jacob's vow to God. And by doing that, making that vow, God blessed him. He became very wealthy. The first principles of this tenth, sometimes referred to as tithe, we find in Leviticus 27, verse 30. You're in Genesis. Go to the third book of the Bible, Leviticus. We'll read the last, from the last chapter, verse 27, or chapter 27, verse 30. Leviticus 27, verse 30. Here we find some of the first principles of this tenth, or tithe, as it's sometimes referred to. Leviticus 27, verse 30, says, All the tithe and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is whose? Is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. There's only a few things in the Bible that are called holy. God is holy. God's name is holy. The Sabbath is holy. And here the Bible says that the tithe is holy. What's tithe? Tithe, the dictionary says, is 10% of something. So the tithe, or 10%, belongs to who? 
belongs to God. To return 10% to God is our way of saying thank you to God for all the blessings that he gives us. To return a tenth to God, a tithe to God, is to acknowledge that God is the rightful owner of everything. The Bible says in James 1.17, mark this down, every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? Is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Jacob said, God, I want to say thank you for all your blessings to me. I'm going to return one-tenth back to you of everything you give me. And God blessed him abundantly for doing that. When we return a tenth to God, we're saying thank you to God. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 8, verse 18, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to what? Get wealth. Who gives you the strength to get your money, to get your wealth? God does. And so by returning a tenth to God, we're saying, thank you for the strength you give me to get my wealth. I really don't own anything. Everything that I have belongs to God. He gave me my health. He gave me my time. He gave me my strength. And that's what I used to earn money with. So really, it's all gifts from God. Every good gift comes from God. And he give us the, gives us the power to get our wealth. 10% back to God. Returning a t- What was that tenth to be used for? You're in Leviticus. Let's go to the next book in the Bible, Numbers 18, verse 21. The tenth, or tithe, belongs to who? Belongs to God. What was it supposed to be used for? Let's read the answer here from from Numbers 18, verse 21. Numbers 18, 21, God says, here's what we're going to use the tithe for. Behold, I have given the children of Levi... All the tenth in Israel, that's a tithe, all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance, for their service, which they serve, even the servants of the tabernacle of the congregation. So God says, I'm giving all the tithe to Levi. Who were the Levites? They were the priests of the Old Testament. Why were they given the tithe? God says, for their service, which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle or the temple. So God says, I'm giving them the tithe for their pay, for their service in the church, the Old Testament church. This was so that the pastors, the priests, they wouldn't have to go out and get a job. They could spend full time in serving in the temple. God says, I'm going to give them the tenth as their pay. You might wonder, did that same concept carry from the Old Testament to the New Testament church? Well, let's find out. Come with me to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 and 14. Did this tithing concept, returning 10% to God, given, given for the ministry, did it carry to the New Testament church? 1 Corinthians 9 answers that, verses 13 and 14, New Testament. Am I going too fast tonight? Uh, yes, no, Hello? Not really? Okay. I want to get ahead of you here. 1 Corinthians 9, 13 and 14. The Bible says, Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? That God set it up that way back in the Old Testament. They got 10% of everything that was brought. Verse 14 says, Even so, what's it mean, even so? Same way. Even so hath the Lord ordained. Who ordained this? God did. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Just as in the Old Testament the priests were sustained by the tenth or tithe, so in the New Testament the gospel minister, the ministry is to be supported, sustained by the tithe. And I might mention in the Seventh-day Adventist church, the pastors are not getting rich off the program. There are some churches where all the tithe stays in the local church, some of these Sunday churches. And so if the pastor has a big church, if he has a big following, he can build himself a fancy mansion, buy himself a private helicopter or a private jet. I know a pastor, not here in the Philippines. I'm not going to name anybody here in the Philippines, but I know one in America that has, a, has two, pa- this is a pastor, he has two $20 million jets, private jets. He's got a mega church, TV preacher, he gets a lot, you know, all this tithe coming in, he needs a lot of money. 
That's not the way it works in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let me tell you how the tithe works in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We found out God does have a true church that lines up with the identifying marks of the Bible. How does the tithe function in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? When the tithe comes into the local church, it does not stay in the church. It's sent on up to a regional headquarters, a conference headquarters, or here, in here it's a mission headquarters. And from there, a percentage is sent on up to the global church to help carry the gospel of the world. And then a percentage is used to pay the pastor's salary all through the area, the conference or the mission. And it's essentially a laboring man's salary. I've always said you cannot get wealthy as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor unless you've got a billion dollar, a billionaire uncle who happens to be giving you money. You can't get rich on the Seventh-day Adventist pastor's salary. It's a laboring man's salary. And you get the, essentially the same salary whether you have a big church or a little church. So there's no incentive to water down the truth so you can get more members and get more salary. It doesn't work that way. And if you have some member of the church that's a wealthy member but they have sin in their life and you have to go reprove them of their sin, you don't have to fear that that's going to affect your salary because you're not being paid as a Seventh-day Adventist minister from the local church. You're being paid by the mission or by the conference. Set up very fairly in the Seventh-day Adventist church. But in some other churches, well, all the money stays in the local church, and if you've got a big church, you get a lot of money. That's not the way it works in the Seventh-day Adventist program. You might wonder what Jesus has to say about the tithe. Let's find out from Matthew 23, 23. This is actually easy to remember. Matthew 2, 3, 2, 3. 23, 23. Jesus is speaking here to the Pharisees. And by the way, they were very careful tithe payers. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin. That's those little tiny seasonings or seeds and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Jesus says, you're doing right in returning tithe, but you've omitted some more important things, judgment, mercy, and faith. You should do those things, but don't leave the tithe undone. So Jesus is endorsing the tithing program. I've had people say, well, I thought the tithe was just for the Jew. Well, are the blessings of God just for the Jew? Have you ever stopped to wonder why Jews typically are so wealthy? There must be some financial formula they're following to get all the wealth. And I'm showing it what it, what, what it is tonight, returning 10% back to God. That's what the Jews faithfully do, and many of them are very wealthy. God blesses them for that principle. If you want to be blessed also by God, then you need to follow that principle. The Bible says in Leviticus 27, verse 30, all the tithe of the Jew, whether the seed of the Jew or the fruit of the Jew, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. <laughs> I see some of you shaking your heads. I missed something, right? <laughs> That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says all the tithe of the, of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is whose? It's the Lord. So it's not just the Jew. All the tithe of the land, whether people return it or not, it belongs to God. And I want to clarify right here, you do not give tithe to God. You return tithe to God. The tithe is not yours. So you don't give somebody something that belongs to them. You return to them what's theirs. We don't give God tithe. We return to God tithe because it's his. Now, let me ask you, is God asking too much? 10%? Is that too much? For example, suppose I had a million euros. No, I don't. Don't misunderstand me. If I, if I had a million euros, what would my tithe be? 100,000 euros. Could I afford it? Of course, if I had a million euros, I can afford 100,000 100, euros to God. No problem. If I have $10, I do. I asked my wife for that. She'll give it to me. My wife handles all the money. <laughs> I have $10. How much is my tithe? One dollar. Can I afford it? Of course. God is not asking too much of us. And really, God gives all, everything to us anyway. The Bible says, read with me, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. 
If you want to be rich, then you must have what? The blessing of the Lord. And I'm showing you how to get that. Return one-tenth to God. Well, how important is it to return tithes? I had a man, after he came to this particular lecture, he told me on the way out, he said, Pastor, I came tonight to learn the secret to security and financial prosperity. I didn't come to find out I had another bill to pay. <laughs> well, the tithe is not a bill. The tithe is a blessing. And you'll find, you'll experience the blessing of the tithe as you return that tithe to God. I had a couple come to me one time after they heard this lecture. They, this was, I was lecturing in America. And these, this couple was from South America. They were, they were in, in America studying at the local university. So they were foreigners. They were paying their school bill. They had two children. They were paying for their children. They were renting a house and they had all the expenses of, of life. And they said, Pastor, we don't have enough money now. We're actually several months behind on our rent payments. They said, every month we're going a little bit farther behind in all of our bills. And you're telling us we've got to return 10% to God? That's unreasonable. You're asking too much. How are we supposed to do that? I said, well, if you don't have enough money now, you ought to try God's formula. 10% to God, and what's he do? He blesses. The blessing of God, it maketh rich. Well, how important is it? Let's read the answer from Malachi. You are in Matthew. Back up one book. You will be in Malachi. Malachi 3, verses 8 and 9. This is probably the clearest text in the Bible dealing with the tithe teaching or principle. Malachi 3, verses 8 and 9. Back up one book. You're in Matthew. Back up one book. You'll be in Malachi. Malachi 3, verse 8 says, Will a man rob God? That would be pretty serious. It would be bad, en would be bad enough to rob a person, but to rob God... Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? Well, Lord, where, how have we robbed thee? What's God say? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Let me ask you this. How many of you here would like to have God's curse? Let me see your hand. Well, how do we get it? By refusing or neglecting to return tithe to God. Tithes and offerings. The Bible says we're cursed with a curse. Leave your finger in Malachi. We're going to come right back. And let's go back to that little book of Haggai. I should have told you to leave a ribbon there. Let's just back a few pages. Haggai 1, verse 9. Haggai 1, verse 9. The page is there, so hopefully that will help you to get to Haggai. Haggai 1 verse 9 says, are you there? Haggai 1 9, God says, you looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did what? I did blow upon it. I can't blow like God. <laughs> when God blows on your income, how much will be left? Nothing. Nothing. I don't care how much you, you could make it, you could earn a million euros a month, and if God blew on it, there'd be none left. So here God says, you look for much, you thought you were going to have a lot of money, and lo, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew on it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, why? Because of my house, that's God's church, because of my house that is waste, and you run every man unto his own house. God says, you're more concerned with your own affairs, your own home, than my house, the church. And so when you bring your salary home, God says, I'll blow on it. Now, let me ask you this. If your income is cursed by God and blasted by God, will you have enough money? Never. What we need is God's blessing, not God's curse. And we get that curse by refusing or neglecting to return the tenth to him, which will go further. Nine-tenths of my earnings with God's curse are ten-tenths with God's... Oh, let, me, let me back that up. Nine-tenths with God's blessing are ten-tenths with God's curse. I'm going to confuse you yet, huh? Which will go further? Nine-tenths of my earnings with God's blessing or ten-tenths of my earnings with God's curse? Which one? 
it, mathematically, nine is less than ten. But in God's mathematics, nine is more than ten. When we return to God what belongs to Him, the ten percent along with our offerings, God takes what's left and He stretches it out, over, under, around, or whatever, all the bills. There'll be enough money and then some if we're faithful. What's the promise say? Read with me. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. If I'm not returning tithes and offering to God, will I have his blessing, yes or no? No, instead I have his what? I have his curse. So I'm showing you this, the Bible's secret to financial prosperity. The blessing of God. The blessing of God, the Bible says, is what's going to make you rich. And the way to get that blessing is to return to God what belongs to him along with our offerings. Now, some of you are probably thinking, Pastor, I've never returned tithe. How am I going to pay that back? <laughs> I'll be paying that bill the rest of the... If I've got to go back and pay all that back tithe that I never paid, <laughs> I'll be in debt the rest of my life. Well, there's a way you can have your debt with God canceled. And that's what we call baptism. Or rebaptism. When a person's placed beneath the water, the old life, the old account is buried. They're resurrected to a new life, a new beginning with the Lord. And now after you've begun anew with Jesus, what about the tithe? Are we going to continue to rob God? No, of course not. We're going to be faithful now to return 10% back to God along with our offering. So you can't have your debt canceled through baptism or rebaptism. Which brings us to another question today. Where should we give our tithes? Let's read the answer from Malachi. Go back to Malachi if you left your finger there. Malachi 3 verse 10. Malachi 3 verse 10. Where should we return our tithes to? The answer is here in Malachi 3, verse 10. God says, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. What's a storehouse? That there be, may be meat, or means, that it, money that is, in mine house. What's God's house? The church. So now you know where to return the tithe to. Bring you all the tithes in the storehouse, the church, that there be me, may be money in mine house, and prove me. Now, God says, test me. Don't, I'm not just saying, do it. He says, prove me, test me. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a tiny blessing, you won't know where it fell. Is that what the Bible says? No, God says, I'll pour out such a blessing, you don't have enough room to receive it. Would you like the blessing of God? I'm showing you how to get it. Return your 10% ten back to God, to his church, along with your offerings. And what does God promise that he'll do? He'll open the windows of heaven. And he'll pour out blessings. Just financial blessings? Oh, no, he'll pour out family blessings, health blessings, spiritual blessings, all sorts of blessings. Jesus said, Matthew 6, verse 33, read with me. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. When I choose to return to God 10% with my offerings, am I putting God first, yes or no? Yes. If I have a tough month, and I say, well, the bills are really, I got more bills this month than I have income. So this month, God will have to understand, God understands, I'll use my tithe money to pay this bill. Am I putting God first now? No. no. And Jesus says, if we'll put him first, then, then what? Then we're going to starve, right? Is that what he says? No, he says, all these things will be added to you. All what things? Verses 30, 32, 31, 32, what we eat, what we wear, the things we have to work for. God says, if you put me first, I will take care of all your needs. The blessing of God, it will make you rich. Let's read the next verse, those of you that have a garden. Uh, let me just ask, anybody here have a garden? No, we're in the city. Oh, I see a few hands. This would be good in the village, I guess. But let's read it anyway. Malachi 3, verse 11, God says, not only is he going to bless your finances, he'll bless your garden. Those of you, maybe those of you that are watching, you have a garden. Malachi 3, 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes 
And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So God says, if you'll return the tithe with your offerings, I'll bless even your garden. Sometimes God tests us. I heard the story one time of the farmer. One year, the locusts came to the area where he was farming. You know what the locusts are? That's those grasshoppers. They eat everything green. And one year, the locusts came, and they were eating up every farm around him. They were approaching his farm. And when they got to his farm, they crossed right through the fence. They ate up his old farm, too. And his neighbors came to him after. They said, oh, you told us that if you were faithful in returning tithe, God would rebuke the devourer. Look at you. You paid all that money to God. He didn't bless you any more than us. You know what the farmer said? He said, well, neighbors, he said, I don't know why this has happened, but this is not my farm anyway. This is God's farm. And those are God's grasshoppers. If God wants to feed his grasshoppers on his farm, that's his business. The farmer went back out after the grasshoppers had left. He replanted his, his crops, and that year he had the biggest harvest he had ever had in all of his years of farming. So God tested him and then came back through and blessed him just as he promised. You can know the promise is sure. Philippians 4 verse 19, my God shall supply what? All your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, not everything we need, or not everything we think we need, do we really need. If I kneel down, I say, Lord, I'm going to be real faithful to return my tithes, my offerings to you, because I want a new Mercedes car. Do I need that? Probably not. <laughs> so if God sees I need it, he'll provide it. My God shall supply all your need. That's a promise. But what must we have? We have to have God's blessing, not God's curse. Let's read the promise again. Proverbs 10, 22, all together. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. If you want to be rich, you must have the blessing of the Lord. And if you're robbing God by not returning 10% to him with your offerings, instead of the blessing, you get the curse. We don't want that. We want God's blessing. So practically, how do we do this? Well, let's imagine that my salary here in the Philippines is 100,000 pesos. I know that's not enough, but just for the sake of illustration. I don't know if that's high or low or whatever. <laughs> 100,000 pesos. We just use that as kind of an illustration. How much is my tithe? Not my tithe. How much is God's tithe? 10,000 pesos. So we return to God 10% of our earnings. It's not after I pay all my bills, whatever's left over after all the bills are paid, then God gets 10% of that. <laughs> it's 10% at the beginning. Proverbs 3 verse 9, honor the, honor the Lord with the first fruits. So the first thing we do in our family when we receive our salary, 10% is God's. We set that aside for tithe. 10% or if you are a pensioner, then whatever your pension is as it comes in, your retirement check, 10% goes to God. If I have a farm, my banana tree gives me 10 kilos of bananas. How much is God's? One kilo is God's. Now, usually what people do, they figure the value of that kilo of fruit monetarily, and then they return that in money to the church. And I tell people, when you do the calculation, don't figure that your produce is not too, worth too much. If you cheat God, who are you really cheating? You're cheating yourself. I always tell people, figure that your fruit is the most valuable, the most expensive. Set the highest price on it. And if there's any question, I always want to give God the extra. Because you know what happens? He always comes back. You cannot outgive God. The more you give to God more he gives right back to you in blessings. So one-tenth of our increase, one-tenth of our earnings, and if we have a garden or crops, then one-tenth of our increase, we return to God in tithe. God tests us with one-seventh of our time. What is that seventh? The Sabbath, Saturday, and he tests us with 10% per of our increase, tenth, the tithe. The Bible says in Malachi 3, verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. 
But you say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and what else? And in offerings. Tithe belongs to who? Belongs to God. So when you return tithe, are you giving God anything? You're giving God nothing. You're just returning to Him what's His. Now, if you want to give God something, you have to go beyond the tithe. And that's what's called offerings. Now, the Bible doesn't say how much to give in offerings, how often to give. I know some people, they give one-tenth tithe and one-tenth offerings. That's their choice. So that's actually 20% of their earnings. Do you think they suffer for that? You're afraid to answer that, huh? <laughs> they don't suffer, I can sh assure you. I know some people, they give one-tenth tithe and two-tenths offering. That's 30% of their income. Back to God. You think they suffer? Not at all. I've heard of people, they give one-tenth tithe and three-tenths offering. That's 40% of their income. They return to God. And some of them are the wealth, some of the wealthiest people that you meet. God blesses them abundantly. The blessing of God is what's going to make you rich. But let's can come back to the offerings. When we give offerings, we can decide how much to give and how often to give. But there are two principles that we should use when we give offerings. Number one, give unselfishly. And a good text for that is Luke 21, verses 1 to 4, talking about the widow who had two mites. It was all she had. She gave it unselfishly. Do you think she starved after that? Do you think? Not at all. Her sacrificial gift has motivated billions of dollars to flow into God's cause. So number one, give unselfishly. Somebody once said, the value of our gift to God is not determined by how much we give, but how much we have left after we give. Think about that for a moment. The value of our gift to God is not determined by how much we give. Back in Jesus' day, the wealthy, they were giving these huge amounts of money. But Jesus commended the widow. How much did she give? Two mites. But it was all she had. The value of our gift to God is not determined by how much we give, but by how much we have left after we give. The Bible says, Jesus says, Luke 6, verse 38, give and what? It shall be given unto you good measure. Think about going to the, down to the market. You know, they always try to cheat you at the market. Jesus says, give, it will be given unto you good measure. They're not cheating you. Press down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all, it shall be measured to, to you again. The more you give, the more you receive. Now, sometimes God tests us. Let me just tell you a personal story. We began our ministry years ago, back in 1993, in Ukraine. We've done meetings throughout Eastern Europe. We've held seminars like this in Ukraine and Hungary, Bulgaria, Albania. We were in Albania in 1997. And at that time, we didn't have a home in America. And we don't have one now either. We're just renting. But anyway, we had, no, we, we had no home in America. We had most of our stuff with us in Albania. We were living there as missionaries, planning to spend at least a year there and maybe longer. And this was 1997 when Albania fell into anarchy, started in the south, began coming northward. I remember when the capital city, Tirana, there in the middle, as you can see, fell to the insurgents. And then we were up in the northern city of Skodra doing an, a prophecy seminar just like this. And I remember the night that the insurgents broke into the local armory and they stole all the guns. The police disappeared. The military disappeared. Everybody was afraid. The next day at the open market, you could buy a machine gun for $5. Everybody bought one. And it was complete lawlessness. People were breaking into shops, breaking into homes. People were being killed. I remember that night, the night before, when they broke in and stole all the guns. You could see these bullets flying up. Everybody was just shooting up in the air just to show their neighbor, I got a machine gun. You better not come try robbing me because I'll kill you. And so it was complete lawlessness. So we called our embassy. They said, we said, what should we do? We, they said, we're advising all Americans to leave immediately. And the church leadership, they called us. They said, please leave Albania. It's too dangerous. 
So we packed up our stuff. We had most of our earthly possessions with us. Packed it all up in the corner of the house we were renting. And we fled Albania in this car, this little red Volkswagen. There were four of us, our family. Of course, you can see our children were a bit smaller back then. But we had our family of four and three student missionaries, seven of us in this car. So we couldn't take a lot. Each one of us, we had one small suitcase. You know the kind of suitcases that they, they, the airline lets you carry on? Of course, now they don't let you carry much weight in them. But anyway, one of these small suitcases, that's all we could take. Just basically some clothes. And we fled. We got out of Albania just hours before the border station, the northern border station, fell to the insurgents. If we hadn't got out when we did, we probably wouldn't have gotten out. So we drove up through Yugoslavia. Up in, we were refugees. We had no idea where to go. Headed up into Germany. When we got into Germany, some Adventist brethren there heard about what had happened to us. And one of the brothers in the church said, I have an empty apartment you can stay in. We went into his apartment. He, he had, it was fully furnished. There was linens on the bed. He had food in the cupboards, dishes. We had just our four suitcases, almost nothing. And here was a fully furnished apartment. He said, you can stay in this apartment as long as you need to. So we sent the missionaries, the student missionaries, back home to America. We called up Amazing Facts. That's who we worked for. We said, we want to come back to America. They said, well, we don't have any seminars lined up for you here in America. You stay there in Europe. We'll find something for you there. So we were waiting. After a few weeks, they made arrangements for us to do a seminar in Hungary. So we packed up. It was very easy. You know, four suitcases, four the little suitcases. Very easy to pack up. And we drove from Germany to Hungary. And we had a seminar. All I had was my seminar Bible. Not this one, but one like this one. But I had a, there was a brother there. He loaned me, this was the, before the days of PowerPoint. He loaned me some slides, old Kodak slides. And we had a great seminar. After that seminar, we were invited to do a program in Bulgaria. So we packed up again, very easy to pack up. We packed up and we drove down to Bulgaria. I don't know if you know anything about Bulgaria. Bulgaria is a country of thieves. We stopped at the capital, Sofia, to make arrangements with the local church brethren there for the seminar. While we were in the conference office planning for the meetings, thieves broke into this car and stole three of those four suitcases, <laughs> along with one of my wife's handbags. The one suitcase that they left was the one on the bottom. It was my, happened to be mine with my seminar Bible in it. We lost everything. My wife had nothing more than the clothes that she was wearing. And you can imagine, she sat down that night and she cried a few tears. We were thinking, Lord, here we are in your work and we've lost everything. We left everything we owned back in Albania thinking we'd probably never see it again because they were breaking into the homes and stealing everything. So we thought we'll probably not see that stuff again. And then we just had these four suitcases and now three of them have been stolen. When I left the car, we had everything locked up. I had a bar locking the steering wheel to the clutch. When we came back to the car, every door had been unlocked, and they had unlocked the bar that was locking the steering wheel. I think they were planning to steal the car, and they saw us coming, and so they grabbed a few things and fled. But here we were. We had lost it all. We thought, we got to go back to America now. One week later, my father-in-law, who happened to be with us, he was working for ADRA, Adventist Development Relief Agency. He traveled, he had his microbus, he traveled across Bulgaria, across Macedonia, you can see it there in the map, across Macedonia, into Albania. This was summertime now, 1997, in Albania. The UN had moved into Albania to enforce order. My father-in-law was met at the border by four military vehicles, given a military escort to the capital, joined a convoy of military vehicles, went up to that northern city of Skodra, went to the home we'd been renting, and when he went to the home, all of our stuff was still there. We made friends with the owners of the home. They had actually guarded our stuff with their machine gun. They told the neighbors, you come for that stuff, <laughs> you're going to wish you hadn't. So my father, he loaded all of our stuff up in his microbus, again with a military escort, because it was still very dangerous in Albania. Military escort all the way out of Albania, across Macedonia, back to Bulgaria, and we had it all back. God gave it all back to us, except for those three suitcases. <laughs> the Bible says, give, and what? It shall be given unto you, and we can testify that has truly happened in our lives. The Bible promise is, read with me, 
The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Proverbs 10, verse 22. Somebody once told me, Pastor, if God already owns everything, why does he need my money? <laughs> well, first of all, is it my money? Not really. But there's two reasons why God asks for his tithe and our offerings. First of all, this is how God finances the work of the ministry, carrying the gospel to the world. That's God's program. But secondly, giving helps us to be unselfish. Continual giving starves selfishness to death. Let's come back to the reasons for giving offerings. Number one, give unselfishly. Number two, give cheerfully. Our text is 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. We're talking about offerings here. The tithe, we don't give. We return that. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Verse 7, every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not how? Not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loves what? A cheerful giver. I have people tell me all the time, oh, you know, the churches, all they want is money. Always passing that basket. I hate to see that thing come by. Is that the right attitude? Jesus says, now we're not talking about tithe. The tithe we don't give. We return that. That's God's. But the offerings, if we're going to give offerings, we're supposed to give them how? Cheerfully. Let me illustrate this way. Let's imagine today was your birthday. And I say, oh, happy birthday. I guess I got to give you a gift. Sure don't want to. Wished I didn't have to, but I will. What would you tell me? You say, Pastor, if you don't want to give me a gift, then keep your gift. You don't have to give me a birthday gift. And that's essentially what God is saying. If you don't want to give, now we're not talking about tithe. Tithe is, we don't give tithe. We return that. But when we're doing the offerings, that's what we give. God says, if you're going to give, give how? Cheerfully. Give cheerfully. Jesus shows us that our money and our heart are closely tied together. Let's read that from Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 20 and 21. Somebody once said the most sensitive nerve in the human body is the nerve connected to our wallet. <laughs> That's probably true. Matthew 6, 20 and 21. Jesus says... But lay up for yourselves treasures in the stock market. Uh, oh. <laughs> Maybe I should read verse 19. Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is... There will your heart be also. That's a principle. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And the reverse is true. Where your heart is, that's where you're going to put your money. Right? People like to invest in the things they love. Their home, their car, their children or their grandchildren. They like to invest money in their children. Or their sweetheart. When that man is in love with his honey, he'll spend his last pesos on her. Right, men? Oh, the silence is deafening. I know, I've done it. I spent my last dollar on my sweetheart, my wife, to buy her a flower, to buy her a car, to buy her something special. Because I love her. I've done it on more than one occasion. A man will spend his last pesos on his sweetheart. Right, men? <laughs> Before he marries her, of course. <laughs> After marriage? Oh, things change very quickly. Wife comes to her husband. Uh, honey, I, I need to go down and buy some groceries. You got, a, got some, some more money? I'm out of money. Ugh. You're always asking for money. You spend too much of our money. We're going to be broke the way you spend money. 
Before he married her, he'd give his last pesos to her. After he marries her, he growls at her for every peso she asks for. <laughs> What's happened? Well, maybe the love has started to <laughs> drop off. Jesus says, read with me, For where your treasure is, there will be your heart be also. Where's your treasure? If your treasure's in the stock market, that's where your heart is. If your treasure's in your home, that's where your heart is. If your treasure is in God's cause, that's where your heart is. When you love Jesus, you take delight in investing in the advancement of His work on earth. It's a joy to be able to give to Jesus when you love Jesus. So if you want to have security and financial prosperity, stop robbing God. I say that kindly. And start returning to God what belongs to Him. That's the tie. That's His. Along with our offerings. And watch God bless. God doesn't say, do it. He says, prove me. Test me. Try it out. Not just for a week. <laughs> Try it out for a month at least or longer. And see if God won't open the windows of heaven. And pour out those blessings. What's the promise? Read with me again. The blessing of the Lord. It maketh rich. And he addeth no sorrow with it. Proverbs 10 verse 22. Let me ask you. How much did Jesus give? 10%? He gave everything. What he really wants from us is our heart. If we, he has our heart then there'll be no problem for us to return to Him what belongs to Him along with generous offerings as long as He has our heart. If He doesn't have our heart, then we'll grudge everything we give to Him. So really, we need to give Him our hearts. Would you like to ask Jesus tonight to help you be faithful to return to God what is His along with our offerings? I'm going to want to ask for His help to be faithful in doing that. May I see your hand tonight? We're going to end our meeting by singing this grand hymn, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. Let's stand together as we sing this hymn.
Father, this song is our prayer. We would rather have Jesus than anything in this world. We pray you'd help each of us to be faithful to return to you what belongs to you, the tithe, 10%, along with our free will, cheerful offerings. And as we do that, we ask that you would open those windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon each person. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.